Thanks to all of you, Fishing DMV hit its major milestone on Patreon of 150 Patreon subscribers. This Saturday, August 17th at 6 p.m. at Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia, we'll be having our very first meet and greet. Food will be provided free of charge to all Patreon members. We'll also have special merchandise that'll be going out, again, free to all Patreon members. If you're interested, let me know. Again, it'll be August 17th at 6 p.m. See you there. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits, online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Night Live. Here we are, August 12th, man, into the dog days of summer. And the bass fishing, usually for the green ones, it's a little slow right now. Uh, most of the brown ones are about under 10,000 feet of water because of the flooding. So you're flipping the foundation, so you can't catch those. But we have snakehead that are able to bite. And that's what's so cool about our area is you have the seasonal patterns. And I remember when I used to go down to the Keys and they would always have this little calendar up there to tell you at the bait shop like what's running. And what's nice about our area, there's always something that you can catch right now. And I got a guy on that we're gonna be talking about things from racing cars and motorcycles to catching snakeheads, fishing glide baits. It's gonna be a really, really fun conversation. Uh, something just to kind of uh, go on the other end of the spectrum is uh, Nate, uh, we have a really, really important angler for I NVKBA. His house burnt down, and I'm going to put a little fundraiser actually in the chat right here if you'd like to donate. Uh, he's a really good guy that just came across my page, I'm going to say like an hour ago, I just came across this. So I'm just going to put the link right into the chat so everyone can see that. If you'd like to donate to that, that would be awesome. If not, just, just share it out. Even just sharing and get the word out there is really, really big. Uh, how do I sound, everyone, before I kind of get going here? And we have a lot to talk about, too, about newswire. Bassmasters just finished up at Lake Champlain. A dude almost died because he hit a floating dock because it got cut off from the freaking shore because of the storms. The St. Lawrence River it already saw his first massive tournament, and then you have the Bassmasters going right back up there. And then Jacob Wheeler has won, what, three or four Angler of the Year titles, it feels like, in a row. At what point do we just say he's better than Kevin Van Dam or he's getting up there when it just comes from pure winnings? And I, I get it, like, you have Patrick Walters, people like that, but what... Jacob Wheeler doing is is nuts, but that's neither here nor there. Or no. That's for another show, uh, guys. Without further ado, James Hall, aka Jimbo Slice, the man, the myth, the legend, sir. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here tonight. I appreciate you having me, Thomas. There's a whole bunch of other people you could have had on here, but you chose me, so I really appreciate that. Ah, oh, dude, you're you're cutting yourself short, man. Like. The reason we're late is we just started to get into conversation right away, which was just fascinating hearing kind of your story. Mm. And it, and you're right, like, people really just, bass fishing becomes like the biggest focal point. Um, it really is because of the tournament aspect of it. It is. It drives the numbers. But there's so many other things that you can do. Um, I, I look at so many guys that do the snakehead tournaments, and then they're also, they're red fishing speckled trout fishing they're getting that and that just gets me this antsy like i really want to go out to the eastern shore or down to the bay and just go yep. kayaking just because like i miss that and but we do we get lost in the tournament hustle and bustle of where the pros are going next and it is it is sad in one sense yeah 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 absolutely like uh to be honest with you during that tournament season this is my per, uh, rookie season so pretty much from april to the last event in july I, I just pretty much fished the tournament waters uh, in Virginia just to figure it out. Um, and I didn't really fish anything else. Uh, a couple of my buddies live up in West Virginia to do a lot of smallmouth fishing. Uh, they're like, come out, come out, man. I was like, I, I really need to go out to the, uh, to the Potomac to figure out these waters. I got, I got a lot of money invested into this. I really need to try to figure this out. Um, but yeah, after the season is done, it's free game. I mean, there's so much stuff to fish around. There's ponds to be fished. I mean, where I'm at in Dulles, I'm not gonna say exactly where, but Dulles, there's probably at least 12 ponds in a four or five mile radius yeah. that I could go fish. Half of them I could put in my kayak in. Uh, fortunately, they stock them easily mm -hmm. with four or five pound bass. I mean, those aren't like trophy fish, but I mean, those are good fish for ponds, you know? So. You know, and then once you start getting out to the East Coast with the saltwater stuff, I mean, that's just another level. 
there's just so much stuff to do out here. That's and, something yeah. that's on my plan in 2025 because I have so much time is to start incorporating more salt water because we have the whole bay for God's sakes. It's so yeah. much water. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's expansive out there. Uh, especially down you get to Virginia beach, uh, you know, towards Rappahannock, the stuff down there towards the end of that area. I mean, there's just, it's so vast, so vast. Uh, fortunately I live in Dulles, which is even further away to get, you know, drive to, but I, you know, at some point you got to make that commitment. So, but I'm, I'm definitely game for that at some point. How did you get into fishing? So I got into fishing. Um, so my mother, she's from Hawaii. Uh, my dad, he's from o Oklahoma. And, you know, as a kid, uh, a couple of my cousins, you know, were in Virginia Beach. So we would always just go fishing down there, you know, during the pier or Solomon Islands off the pier. Uh, there's a military base on there. So I've always just always been around fishing, especially when we flew back to Hawaii. We always go fishing in the beach. Uh, so I've always been around fishing, but just, you know, you know, growing up, there's just all these other aspects of life that, but fishing was just never a priority for my family or anything like that, especially when we were in this area. Um, so fast forward, I would say, I don't, you know, to 2008, gosh, just, you know, you're dating my age here, but I don't, if, if I'm not sure if you're familiar, but kayak, uh kayak bass fishing used to be a form if i'm not mistaken i believe you yeah um so i used to get on that form a long time ago and it had you know catch you know where, where you catch fish you know fishing reports it had divisions of like all over the country mid-atlantic south north everything like that so i would just get on that and you know figure out how to fish off the bank. Cause everybody started fishing the bank. Uh, I think I started at Beaver Dam Reservoir when I moved into this area and I would get snagged up and stuff like that or on the Potomac. Uh, so that's when I found that, that form. And then I ended up picking up a, uh, an old, a Coleman fishing kayak from Dick's Sporting Goods. And then I would just take that to the Beaver Dam Reservoir and, and fish that. Um, but again, this was back in like, 2008 2009 or something like that fishing kayaks weren't even a thing at that time they were just kayaks that caught people just kind of rigged mm -hmm. up fishing kayaks you know and at the time i think it was the wilderness tarpons were the you know the the kayaks to have at that time um so that's kind of where i started that you know just do that form and then i just kind of reached out and and learned um other different clubs in the area i think it was Potomac River Smallmouth uh, Club was was big back then, <clears throat> so I would I would go there. And to be honest, I was the youngest guy going into that place uh, in my early twenties. Um, but I learned a lot. Of, I learned a lot from them. Um, Jeff Little, he was a big influence for me in that in this area. He, him, and Chad Hoover were big pioneers of kayak fishing, mm -hmm. the kayaks in itself back then. So, you know couple more years i think they had released the ride 115 and like that was like the the new fishing kayak for a solo person it was 10 it was 10 foot um and and, and i had just broken my collarbone uh, a year earlier so transporting a kayak was kind of hard so i needed something that was kind of light and that kind of actually fit the bill and it was fishing you could stand on it so i had that for a couple years um and then I ended up selling my house um, and, it, and the house I had, I had a garage. So I had to downsize and I am just selling all that. Um, mm -hmm. like, and I, I ended up keeping my, my rods, my reels, a lot of my lures at the time. Um, <clears throat> but the one thing that really stuck around when I, at, when I was doing, uh, you know, that form at the time was the snakehead stuff. It was so um, very rare that you would, you know, see posts about people catching snakeheads. It was just so yeah. rare, but it just fascinated me because I was like, man, look at those things, you know, and they're like right here. So um, when I got rid of my kayak, I knew I, I marked down like these spots all over the map where I saw these guys catching snakeheads back in like 2010. And I knew at some point when I'd get back into kayak fishing, I would, you know, get back into snakehead fishing because that's like, that's always been an interest of mine. It always looked really fun. 
um, really challenging you know, other than just bass fishing. Um, so <clears throat> I'd probably say about two years ago, um, no, I'd probably say about COVID, um, the racing scene kind of dying down for me a little bit. Um, you know, you really couldn't get out. So it, as far as everything was locked down. So I just started picking fishing back up a little bit. Um, uh, my buddy had a John boat. We were going to the res a bunch. Um, so of course I'm back on YouTube, you know, tactical bass and trying to figure out all this stuff. You could see my garage. I, I used to make, I mean, I still make lures. I got terminal tackle. I got so much lures from them and stuff like that, but I was just learning how to learn how to bass fish, um, again, uh, after all those years of hiatus. Um, but I knew snakehead, like I, I wanted to get back in the snake because I saw him in the res, like when I was back there fishing with my buddy and I was like, I, I got to get back into it. Um, so Memorial Day came around maybe about last year, Dick Sporting Goods. I picked up a, you know, a five Sea Ghost 110 and that's where it started. Um, and just when I knew they were in Potomac, like down Stafford area. So I just kind of, <clears throat> actually, it's actually funny. I actually sold a swim bait rod to a guy on Facebook. And we were actually talking about fishing and he was like, Hey, I'm about to go snakehead fishing. And, and again, I had just bought this kayak maybe like two or three weeks before. And I was like, dude, you, can I go with you? And he was like, sure, man. And he actually tucked me. So, and he took me down to a uh, crow's nest. Um, and that day, dude, I, I caught a 28 inch snakehead and I was hooked. I was hooked after that. And ever since then, I have just been addicted to snakehead fishing. It's, um, it's crazy how we have that moment, right? We can always remember that that moment where like it clicks and the addiction sets in. Oh, I do. I, I'll never forget that day. I remember exactly where I was at, how I was fishing, how it struck, how it missed it the first time, everything. Um, it was just unbelievable. I mean, and again, once you set that hook and that fight and how they fight you, and then that's just one aspect of it. Getting it to the net, getting in the net is another aspect of it. getting it into the kayak getting the lure out of its mouth with you know your first time out not even know what the hell this thing is i mean having the right tools i mean it's a daunting task but like once you're done man you're just like oh my god you're full adrenaline i mean it's almost like hunting if you mm -hmm. talk to a lot of people uh it's it's almost like hunting so it's it's I, it's unbelievable unbelievable and when you combine the top water explosion, the, the drag screaming, and then also that they are good to eat, they actually do taste good. And that's such a weird combo. And then again, it's something I brought up on other shows with other, with other guests is the sex appeal of the fish with the coloration is cool. The way they look is cool. A trophy fish is called a dragon. Like you can't pay for that kind of press coverage to get that kind of cool name like that. No, not at all. Nah. Now, Something else I wanted to bring up though was um, race cars and driving. And is that how you broke your collarbone? Uh, that was actually snowboarding. Oh, okay. Snowboarding <laughs> uh, in a terrain park, uh, trying to, you know, do stuff I shouldn't be doing and uh, just landed wrong on the collarbone and just snapped it. Uh, yeah, that was uh, an epic uh, 10 weeks in itself. But uh, oh my God. Ugh. Yeah, you know. Unfortunately, with collarbones, it's it's you got two options. It's either let it heal by itself or surgery. Uh, unfortunately, I had to have surgery, so um, I had a metal pin in me and all that good stuff. But you know, that was a long time ago. But no issues anymore. I could lift my arm and, and fish and kayak, no problem anymore. So we're good there. So, like again, I don't know a lot of people that that race as a passion. And how do you? How does one stumble into that? It's almost as fascinating as how you stumble into fishing in Northern Virginia. Uh, I've always been into cars. Um, you know, growing up traveling, uh, we used to do a lot of road trips and I used to be fascinated with like 18 wheelers, stuff like that. Um, and you know, old Mustangs and Camaros, stuff like that. So I've always just been into cars. And, uh, as soon as I turned 16, I, I just got my license and just got a car. Um, my dad helped me get my first Honda. It was a Honda and like Acura Integra. 
Um, I put a whole bunch of money into that thing. Try to go to the, uh, I, I didn't try, but I went to the racetrack or MIR, ran like a, a 16 second quarter mile with all this money put into it, which is you know, mm. nothing at all. Um, and then I realized like, I, I got to go faster. I got to go faster. So end up getting into motorcycles. Um, I sold the car for, you know, for, you know, whatever, and then bought a motorcycle for super inexpensive and was able to run a, a 12 second quarter mile with just straps and a dog bones uh, on a stock 750 GSXR. So I was, again, I was hooked on that speed from going from a 16 second quarter mile to like a 12 second quarter mile. So that's just how I got into the racing. Just, you know, just the passion of, of cars and, and stuff like friends, high school, everything of like that, you know, get back to the street racing and stuff like that. But where do you race around here? Is that you have to travel pretty far? Are you going up to um, Summit Point then in West Virginia or, or where do you go? So uh, back when I was earlier, that was just straight drag racing. So that was through uh, like uh, MIR or Rockingham, North Carolina. Um, with the so now I'm into rally, like stage rally and rally cross. And uh, that's more. The, the rally cross is a Washington DC division SCCA. So you could do that's summit point and uh, Panthera, West Virginia. That's a more field, West Virginia. It's like a training facility out there. So we have a big open field where oh, we cool. can make a track and, and race over there. So that's where that venue is for stage stage rally. We go pretty much all over the country or that's all over the country. But for the most part, the guys who I race with are on the Eastern side or Eastern division. So we'll go up to new England, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, stuff like that. But yeah, you know, the racing stuff that that's just fun in itself. But uh, again, uh, now I'm in just more into the crew side of it where I turn a wrench. Uh, I'm a crew chief for one of the stage rally teams, uh, a private team in this area. So that's just been fun, you know, just keeping that car on the track and, and keeping them, you know, running and stuff like that that's got to be high stress though right um a, a, a little bit um but fortunately the, the guy who i i race with he is very meticulous with his car um he builds his car really well so i don't really have to worry about it uh as long as as long as he keeps the car on the road the car is great um so yeah i mean I get it. I'm not really in the car seat anymore and I'm not in the driver's seat or in the passenger seat doing the co-driving. So it's not too much stressful, but yeah, if they, if they wreck and you have to drive out a couple miles to go get them and you're in the middle of like new England, you've never been there. Oh God. Um, yeah. yeah, that could be a little stressful because there's no service also. So yes, yeah, mm. so you have to use your bats to try to figure out where they're at and everything like that. Um, but yeah, but after a while you get used to it. Um, it's fine for me. I love, I love doing that stuff. An interesting analogy that I've used before is is with at least NASCAR, everything to an extent, it, you're on equal playing field, the engine, everything, so you can't get so much of an advantage over your competitors. And when you look at fishing, whether it is the kayak world or bass and stuff, it, is that something that would benefit the fishing world, I guess, to have that kind of like, hey, listen, you know, you can't have an engine that's this big because it gives you way too much of an advantage. Everyone has to have like an even playing field. Is that a good thing, a bad thing? Like, what are your thoughts since you've been in both worlds, so to speak? Uh, so when you talk about motors for kayaks, uh, you know, again, I'm not on the bass side, but for the kayak, yeah. for the snakehead stuff. Yeah. You have a motor, you're not going to win a podium by any means, but it, it allows you to cover more water. Um, so that's a good thing. Uh, I, I don't think that should I guess be it's, it too much. Um, I guess it's the technology thing, I guess, like not just the motors, but it seemed like for NASCAR and certain racing, like they do have limits on like, this is where you guys are allowed to operate with your vehicle versus sure, sure, kayaking and bass. Sure. It's like the wild west unfortunately yeah it it, it kind of is unfortunately um you know this is my my first year of tournament fishing uh would it would i have advantage of it or what i've what i've done better in my rookie season i don't think so but 
I mean, I guess I'm kind of still new to that. So I guess next question. <laughs> no, no, no. It's just because like, okay, let me rephrase it this way. In racing, um, in the thing that you race, did they have limitations on everything? Or is it basically oh, you can... Of okay. course. Yeah, we have certain classes and everything like that. Yeah, definitely. So yeah. it's classes. I didn't know that. Cool. So it's like... Oh, yes. Yes. You have front wheel drive, rear wheel drive, all wheel drive, non-turbo, um, turbo. Yeah, definitely. Obviously, the turbo cars are going to murder the non-turbo cars. Well, I'm not saying uh, all, all the time, but for the most part, <laughs> yeah, there's definitely restrictions on classes and stuff like that. Interesting. Yeah. yeah that's okay that's cool i didn't know that because i know like in the crappie world i guess the comparison would be they have like forward facing versus non-forward facing leagues and you could have those that's interesting actually huh. yeah so for the basic stuff yeah. what i did for the rally cross there was pretty much three uh three classes there was like a stock class there was a prep class and then there was like uh, an unlimited so stock is pretty much if you run anything stock change out the tires uh prep you could do a few things suspension uh, a few motor mods, wheels and tires, uh, just basic stuff. And then you got unlimited. You can do unlimited. So, yeah, you're pretty much racing in your class. Totally and obviously, cool. the more experienced you are, you, you can kind of step up in your class. And some, of that, some experienced guys will stay into the lower classes and dominate, which is fine because they just know how to drive, too. So it's more about just building your car. It's a lot of seat time, too. It's a lot of seat time and, and fishing time on the water. It really is really key. The last racing question is how fast have you gone? Uh, I mean, like legally or on the track? I mean, yeah, yeah, as long as statute limitation, we don't need that. But like, how, like, oh, uh, I mean, I, I think I've looked down on the speedometer and said 143. Uh, but I've definitely been faster than on some of these exotic cars that some of these guys are just been stupid about. But that's just another topic in itself. But <laughs> It's got to yeah. be. I, I've heard people say that th there's a feeling when you do that that cannot be matched in the world. That's why oh, people get addicted to it. Oh, it's tunnel vision. It's a total tunnel vision. Total tunnel vision when you're out there on the streets. It's, um, yeah, that's, again, it's insane. It's insane. <sighs> so I don't know how you go from that kind of adrenaline rush. Like, that's just so cool is going from that to snakehead fishing or, or any fishing, like, does it match the, does it actually scratch the itch like that? Cause good God, I, I don't know, but well, I haven't raced before. So, well, you know, again, at that time I was just doing bass fishing just to have fun. Yeah. So it was just something to get away from. And I always loved fishing. So it was just fun to me. That's why when we talk about tournament bass fishing, it's just, it's never really like, hit that niche for me because i just love fishing and i, and I always want to fish from mm -hmm. like till i die and that's the thing about fishing you could fish from like a, 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 a you know very small age to you're older you know with racing other sports man you, you could you could tire out really quick or you could get too old to to nice. run or play or play certain sports and stuff like that but fishing i always want to fish so i just want to kind of keep it fun as long as i can and that's kind of there's a big kind of dichotomy of tournament fishing if you yeah. can't kind of keep it fun you there's a certain point where you got to get serious and you really got to step it up and there's been that line that i've been kind of you know teetering this season of like man i want this to be fun but again you, no you, you you've got some money invested you got to be serious about this so yeah that's been a learning curve in itself right there but i'm glad you brought that up though because when I, when you get into tournament fishing hard, and this is where you see the guys that do great in practice, like, oh, I caught 30 pounds, or I did really good. I caught two or three, like, over 30-inch snakes. And it's like, great, but then you go to tournament day, and, and where are they? And it's because the people that practice well, they're not out there to have fun or catch fish. It's about mm -hmm. practicing. And no. I don't think a lot of people, as I've matured and gotten older and gotten to be in the boats with some really good sticks, like, the, it's it's a job in practice. You're not sticking fish. You're moving around. You're getting things yep. scoped out. And yep. I don't think a lot of people understand that. It no, is... no, not at all. Um, yeah. Like again, you had Steven on, on your channel a few, few days ago. He's, he's released some really good footage of, yeah. of how to search and stuff like that. Um, and that played a key in, in my first, you know, event. Um, but yeah, you, there's, 
you really got to put the time in um, to to learn to, and to get out there. If that makes sense, I mean, you can you can only watch so many YouTube videos um, and get on Facebook and, and and try to spot burn as much as possible. But you really got to go and, and skunk out. Um, and then this kind of goes back to what we were talking about with motors. Um, so I'm only paddling. Um, so again, when we started from back 2008, like there were no motors for kayaks. So mm -hmm. it was all paddling. So a couple of years ago, I was like, no, I'm going to just paddle everywhere I go. I'm a purist. You know, I learned real quick that paddling is only going to go get you so far. Um, so again, with this tournament season, you know, I could only go so far with the paddle um in pre-fish and stuff like that safely i should say you know sure you could paddle maybe two miles on on a current on a tile and an alkaline tide but if that weather switches in you you're short you know you're not gonna paddle mm -hmm. back you know like is it worth that for you know fishing that one day so you, you know there's a limit of how far you could go with a paddle and how you you know you could go with a motor too. I'm not saying that you could stick right here by a marina and, and win a you know win something also because it's it's definitely been done. But having the ability to get out further and explore definitely broadens your knowledge and you know your area of fishing and knowing more bodies of water and um you know just just the knowledge of getting out and, you know, seeing more water, bodies of water. Um, and, you know, that's kind of the one thing we're in Dulles. I live so far from Stafford, you know, there's so many, dip, you know, you know, Burke Lake has snakehead, uh, the, the res has snakeheads. It sets up completely different from tidal water. Oh, uh, God, yeah. Or yeah. How you approach everything. Uh, <clears throat> Burke Lake in the res sets up completely different how you fish for snakeheads there, mm -hmm. too. So I've, I've had learned how to, you know, fish those two different bodies of water differently. And then you have ponds um, in Dulles that have snakeheads. I'm not going to say any rare, but like yeah. you have to figure out how to fish them too. And that's completely different. You know, they don't just hit the frogs every time, you know? Uh, so. Well, yeah. And, and can you even count the, the Ashburn ponds as like, cause it's like an aquarium because like you're dealing with snakes and these aren't thousand acre ponds they are pretty small. So you kind of hit them and leave it's not it's not yeah. like the res or and and the res is a, is a whole different cat and and even talking to steve and i remember after doing that episode i don't think i actually posted this message but um i, I was talking with steve to whenever it was about snakeheads and how deep they go and i had a couple of people message me and be like dude i have caught snakehead in 15 feet of water using forward facing sonar like I thought like, oh, that's a bass and you stick it and your reel explodes and you bring it to the boat. It's like, that was a snake. And so that just blows your mind that we don't know everything about them. Like they're no. not just in the pads, you know, taking their breaths and that's it. They're, they're evolving almost their strategy to survive. Yes. And they're getting smarter. They yeah. are getting very, they're getting smarter every day. Um, it's, it's crazy. I've been kind of stalking this one in this pond um, and I found him about a year ago and I just kind of got back to him for a couple of weeks ago, but he, he's a smart snakehead. Um, the forge in that pond is so vast. He's not going to hit anything mm -hmm. fake and the water is so clear. Like he could see you. It's crazy. It, it's, it's so funny um, that, you know, how they're all different from, just the bodies of water of, of where they're at. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a learning curve for sure. This last year, this last year for sure. And then I know the questions are starting to rack up here on YouTube and Instagram. And then if you're all over on Instagram, please come on over to YouTube or Facebook because I can actually share your question on the screen. Instagram does not hook up with StreamYards. Why? Who knows? Uh, let's see. Let me start with the newest question first. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, where do I go for snakeheads from the bank or is that some cheese and I need to get a boat uh, from the correct battery staple five five? That's an interesting name. Uh, Lake Brittle, Burke Lake. Um, yep. I heard uh, Lake Orange apparently has them too uh, down that way. There's a bunch of little lakes like that you could probably go to. The problem is 
they get pressured and these things are smart as hell. So those ponds, they're there and there's some big ones, but everyone, they've seen so many baits. Yes. <laughs> they've yep. seen so many baits, man. Yes. Unfortunately, uh, in this area, at least for Virginia. So, um, Burke Lake is definitely, I would say just, just walk around Burke Lake. Mm -hmm. Um, there's some good videos out there to show you some good spots and you just got to be there before anybody else is, but yeah. You could definitely catch snake, uh, snake catch from that. Yeah. Sure. And, and, and honestly, like, it, and I know I've gotten pestered about this too. Pretty much any pond in this, in the Northern Virginia area has a 60 to 80% chance that there's a snake in there. The problem is how many. And I think that's, that's what it really, really comes down to is you could hit these, go there when it's super calm in the evening and you can kind of look to see if they come up and breathe. Honestly, yep. that'd probably be your best bet versus trying to fish all day and just check that out and come back. I, that That's personally how I found them in the past. Uh, it's, I think Red Rocks, or, yeah, Red Rocks and Leesburg, I think that has them, but you're not allowed to fish that place anymore. You'll get in trouble. Yeah, with them. and fortunately, you could, they're pretty close to each other too. So you could kind of hop around a little bit, spend an evening yeah. doing it, which is, which is kind of fun, yeah. And, and Michael has here on Facebook, uh, on, on Lake Anna last summer, the snakeheads were being caught all summer. This summer, the number dropped off in late June when the heat started. Do they go deeper with the heat like other fish? So I would, I would really suggest you can, I've had Odenkirk on the show about seven times a Sunday. He basically did all the biology work with them. Um, I also had the man, the myth, the legend, you know, the house of the dragon himself, uh, Steve uh, Combosis on, and they breathe air. So if you submerge a snakehead and they can't go up, they will actually die. So I, they do dive down, I think like dolphins, but they need to come back up for yep. air. That's why in choppy conditions, my hypothesis is the bike gets wonky is that it's harder for them to get up there and breathe with yep. the chop on the water. I heard you say so, that though. That makes plenty of sense. That makes it, plenty of sense. It all, it just clicked while the show was going. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, especially in Burke Lake, um, you know, they're in the shallows, but the shallow is pretty close to the deep. I mean, the deep is, mm -hmm. is right there. And you, if you once in a while, you'll see them kind of come up see you and then come right back down it's funny <laughs> it's very and, funny and i and again i do think it's like i think you hit it on the head and so many other people did where they are getting so smart of the bow fishing pressure and the pressure and the pads and things like that where i could totally see them 20 feet of water they just they, they come up for air and they drop right back down as fast yep. as possible because they know what boats do and, yep. and my i think that i don't know if that answers your question or not yes i think they go deeper there's also an algae bloom. There's a bad algae bloom if you're talking up at the split of Lake Anna, and I don't know how that would kind of affect those those animals specifically. I've, I've never been. Uh, I haven't been to Lake Anna in, in, in a long time, so I don't know too much about Lake yeah. Anna. That I heard but, there. They're, they're in there, and they're getting more, especially since there's so much water willow now. It, it seems like wherever there's water willow or yep. any kind of SAV, like they're yep. going to be better off there than yep. not. Let's see. We got Greg, Greg in the chat. Uh, Greg says, what is your rod reel line setup for snakehead? Uh, which one? <laughs> mm. um, well, I, I'll bring out my, my main one is a, uh, a Dobbins, Dobbins 735, if I can get it. Dobbins 735, uh, Corrado MGL 150. Uh, you don't have to go too crazy. Uh, the Fury, I think it's 130, 130 bucks. The one thing about that, if you break it, you could always upgrade to the Champion Series, uh, the full cork. Those are great rods for 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 um for snakeheads. That's all I always recommend. Definitely, I definitely recommend a uh, better reel than a rod. Uh, mm. with high drag for sure. You could get away with a cheaper rod than a uh, cheaper reel, but definitely invest in a good reel. The Corrado MGLs are really good. The SLXs are really good. I'm a, I'm a Shimano fanboy. I'm starting getting into Daiwa. I shouldn't say that, but you know, Daiwa has some really good stuff. Um, yeah, uh, S, uh, pretty much a. Um, sorry, Dobbin 735 is Dobbin's a frog rod. Um, and then you know the story. Uh, you heard about me dropping a, a G Loomis MBR. Uh, metanium in in the Potomac in Aquaia, uh, and I wasn't even bat. I wasn't even snakehead fishing, and I wasn't even on my kayak. I was on a bass boat, and that thing just oh my god! 
but that that that's kind of like another a seven foot uh, medium heavy uh, is another good uh, just all around snakehead uh, setup. Yeah. You you mentioned something that I would like to get into about the drag because I do feel like some people will they just lock that bitch down and if you're a bass fisherman this is something you do and I have learned if you are on places with striper and places with snakehead you got to thread the drag a little bit because you will break a reel or you'll lose whatever the hell you were throwing because a big one of either species, dude, they will they will strip. They will really try <laughs> hard to yeah. strip you. Yep. Definitely high drag, definitely quality reel for sure. Yeah. Uh, good line. Uh, I I don't, I mean, I like 50 pound on my frog, on my frog rods, but normally it's, it's 40. Uh, from everything else, but I'm just kind of coming from that frog bass fishing field of the 50 pound. Um, and that's another thing when you, cause we were kind of talking about swim baiting, um, how they go so high in the pound test for swim baits, um, compared to the snakehead stuff where, you know, those guys go a little bit lower, but I guess, I guess you're throwing the bigger swim baits, I guess. Right. Well, it's you're also because wobbling. like, uh, this is 120. Oh. This is 220. Oh, and you yeah, can see yeah. this is this is 13 inches. This one here is eight. Like that that's why that's why you're throwing cable. It's just so you can yeah, get your guess, mortgage back. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right. I guess it's it's that really expensive. It's funny we were talking about the dream caster frost, and he had tossed that clutch out there and he he didn't he didn't think twice to jump off his boat to go catch that 200 to go spend for his $250 clutch that he just went, got snapped off. It's hilarious. Hilarious. I mean, I'd probably be doing that too because that's, uh, uh, dude. Gosh. Yeah. I, the I, I, there are some good ones I know, good, good swim bait guys that I know. And man, they'll still throw that thing into a side of a dock, no issues. They don't worry about it. It's like, dude, I could not do that. I get sick to my stomach if I'm too I close mean, to something. Coming, yeah. Coming from the snake and stuff, you know, you can get away with these lures, you know, eight, nine dollars for frogs and stuff like that. It's pretty affordable. The braid line is pretty affordable. Again, the rod and the rods are pretty affordable stuff. You could get into it for pretty affordable stuff. Um, and in the kayak too, you could pretty get into a pretty cheap kayak then, but that swim bait stuff, this game, man, that's, a, uh, I got to take out my part of my mortgage, uh, for, for that stuff or not tell my girlfriend about it, man. But yeah, that that's another game that I'm starting to get into in a little bit, but yeah. Well, what got you into that? I mean, we're talking a little bit, yeah, like we talk a little bit about off air, but is it just, you had a moment of like, that looks cool? No. So uh, back during COVID, like even before COVID, maybe like 2008 or 2018, I had this niche of airbrushing crankbaits. Um, so I started airbrushing crankbaits uh, like 2019 and then COVID hit. And man, that pro the progression of like spraying uh, crankbaits took off it exploded during COVID. everybody was home spraying air uh, your prank baits and stuff like that um i got really good at that but my issue was just finding good blanks like at that time it was all knockoff stuff mm -hmm. so investing you know 15 20 minutes to spray this lure to tune it for another 15 you know 20 minutes it just wasn't worth it um so that's when i was like you know why am i trying to do these little small little crank baits when i should be getting into these you know these bigger swim baits but again, at that time, there weren't any, there weren't really knock, there weren't really knockoff swim baits that you could, I mean, there were, but nothing that were just, um, you know, of value or even worth of doing. Sorry, my, my laptop is about to charge the charger. Um, so that's why I was like, all right, I got to go buy swim baits. Um, so this, again, this is, I guess, maybe 2020, during COVID 2021. It was like one of the very first gatherings that they had down in Richmond. And I went down there and uh, kind of got my feet wet and picked up a couple lures and, you know, had a rod, tossed it around for a little bit um, and just realized it, it wasn't really for me at that point in time, just because I just wasn't investing enough time into it. Because you really have to pick up a swim bait rod and really kind of really have to throw it all day. You can't just pick it up in 10 minutes or fish it for 10 minutes and be thinking you're going to catch it a five, 10 pound bass. Like you really got to figure out, you know, really learn how to do that. Uh, so I just kind of put it away. Um, and then, you know, fast forward down, um, we were talking, we were fishing at Mooney and I had lost that big fish. And I was like, man, I, I just can't go back to just regular, 
you know, conventional bass fishing. Like I, I really had to step up the game to really start doing like trophy bass. And then, mm-hmm. you know, that's where swim bait kind of comes in involved, you know, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So that's kind of where I'm at. Um, I just picked up a couple of new lures, kept a, you know, or, you know, a new rod that should be coming in next week. So I'll, you know, see how that goes in, in a little bit, but. Oh, that's going to be so much fun, dude. And we got, we got, let's see. Ricardo says best lure for snakeheads. And it's probably a top water bait. <laughs> uh, you know, obviously top water is the best is, is always the best and the funnest. I mean, that explosion is always the best. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say frog fishing for snakehead is the best, um, but it's probably not the most effective one, but it's it's the one I recommend for most, for anybody starting off, pick up a frog and go fish for a snakehead that way. Mm-hmm. Start a yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think if you're going to be in snakehead fishing as as guy that's caught a ton of them, sadly, as bycatch during a bass tournament, you're going to catch a lot of bass if you're looking at it from the other angle too, as bycatch. Yeah. So just throw it in the same areas get in there um i would also say like a little bit smaller too uh ricardo they have uh i guess many finesse size frogs as well just yeah, give a different I was, look i was gonna say there's a lot of local guys um in our area who, who are starting to make uh dedicated snakehead lures i mean there's half yeah. a dozen um tactical fishing is a really good company uh tailored lures is also another good one i mean they're specifically made for snakeheads a little bit smaller hooks the the butts stick down into the water um you know they come you know you know they're just so narrow they come to the pads really easily uh really snagless really good good stuff uh you, you know you don't have to go too far they're right here locally definitely local guys they're really good stuff and yeah that's what's so interesting is like as these as these communities and these tribes get bigger and bigger and bigger they create like these neat products to specifically fill that niche. And that's what's fascinating to find out is like, what, so examples, I'm an office. What is the difference between a regular frog that you buy at Bass Pro Shop and a snakehead frog? Like what is the big difference you think, in your opinion? Um, so I would say the size is a little bit smaller. Uh, the hooks are just a little bit smaller, but they're definitely stouter. I mean, yeah, smaller and stouter. Um, and the butts tend to st- sit down in the water a little bit mm. one one i don't think i have anyone out let's see let me pull one out oh I'm dropping them <clears throat> but uh yeah you'll notice like when it's in the water they just kind of sit like this and as soon as that snakehead describes it i mean it's over um but just a little bit smaller than your normal What's that guy, uh, Jason Lee, who, who was crushing them a couple of weeks ago in that MLF? Uh, uh, that Jordan Lee? Yes, Jordan Lee. The scum, uh, what is the name of that? Scum frog? frog? The scum frog. Yeah. You know, that's your typical traditional bass frog. Big, big, you know, four rot hooks. You know, the snakehead stuff are a lot smaller. Uh, like I said, to get smaller hooks, a little bit pointier to get into the uh p- much more smoothest to get into the the pads and stuff like that um and then you have the popping versions are, are really popular to call them out of the pads or the arrowheads uh those are really good ones too but i would say just a little bit smaller uh than your normal bass fishing interesting that's so cool do you think they're colorblind do you think they see color and that is a good question but i know they could see me because <laughs> I, I you watch them even on like super like slow-mo stuff where um oh they track the frog and it's like what the hell are you looking for it, what anomalies in the bait are you picking out before you make that decision uh, you know that that is a good question i mean i've thrown all different types of colors and i think they all don't really think it i mean i would say the color helps per condition as far as the sunlight and everything like that but i don't really think the color really matters with them really you know if it's visible right in front of them and they're they want it they're gonna eat it you know um unless you finesse them but i don't think color matters too much um yeah Hmm. that's really cool one of the things in your little workshop do you like to work on because that you have a setup that makes me jealous 
Um, so man, I, I pour like jigs, uh, swim jigs are my little thing. Uh, football jigs. I do. Um, I, like I said, I used to do the crankbaits. I used to spray those, but I don't, I don't do that anymore. Uh, just because the knockoff stuff, uh, it's just been hard. Um, but yeah, this is kind of like my little workshop, man. I mean, let's see, if, let's see my wall, man. It's actually, oh, I got my cool there. But I mean, this is not even half of my lure stuff. I mean, it goes on pretty far back to lures. It's, it's, oh, it's pretty bad. It, it's I'm pretty jealous. bad. It's, it's pretty bad. Uh, I need to go through it and uh, start filtering out stuff that I don't use anymore. Um, but, you know, this is just my man cave. I come out here, I do whatever I need to do in my kayak. I make lures. I, you know, try to prep for whatever I need to do, even though I don't do tournament bass fishing. Um, but I just love, you know, fishing in general, um, tinkering with other different lures. Um, yeah, man, just typical guy stuff, I guess. <laughs> Is there anything like you want to do outside of tournament fishing, like any goals in, in the fishing world? You know, I guess with the BKE guys, you know, saltwater is, is kind of next, man. Um, at some point, I'd love to get into that saltwater game. Um, I see all those pics of those huge, you know, bull, bull mm -hmm. reds and the sheep heads and stuff like that. I really love to get into that stuff, man. But I, I just can't, I can't justify another kayak and, and, and that setup at the moment with all everything I got. But um, definitely some saltwater stuff at, at some point. But next year, I definitely like to get a little bit more serious in the snakehead, a little bit more serious in the tournament stuff, really start to focus in it. Definitely get a motor to get out a little bit further out to explore more waters. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would definitely like to uh, get a podium uh, finish next year for sure. I think you'll get there. I think it's you always have Absolutely. these like steps. These these. Um, I'm definitely um, confident in, in getting a tournament or a trophy from there. Absolutely. It's interesting how like we progress, like every year you, you can watch how you build and like you don't say make the same mistakes or you learned a little bit and then you have that breakout like i always think like you have that that glass ceiling where you hit the glass ceiling and it's starting to crack and as soon as you break through you just go parabolic with with and it's anything in life honestly oh yeah definitely like i said the you know this season i i got sixth place on the first event and then skunked out all three other events and it, you know at the beginning of the season, I'm like, oh man, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to make points. And then you skunk out your last three. That's a blower. That's a blower, man. I mean, that could really damage your ego, but you really, it's a learning lesson. You got to get back up and, and, and go back out and do it, you know, and finish. You know, a lot of guys don't even finish or even start. Um, so the, just learning how to fail and, and, you know, learning your mistakes, which you did last time and not, you know, not doing that the next time is, is, is really key. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really key of learning and progressing, learning from your mistakes and then keeping a good attitude with it. You know, that's, that's another thing. Cause I mean, you know, you'll go out on pre-fish and, and think you kind of have it nailed in. And then two days later, <laughs> not, a, not yeah. a, uh, for whatever different reasons, whatever, you know, you can count on your hands. Um, that's another rabbit hole in itself, but, um, yeah. And the, that really will set a lot of anglers up for, um, or I guess distinguish a lot of talented anglers also, because you gotta, you have to learn how to, um, how should I say this? Uh, I'm, I'm losing my words here. Um, you know, adjust. You know, especially like we were talking about top water. If you if you just only fish top water all day, you know, you're only, that's only going to work for so long. You really got to, you know, really have to adjust. And that was one thing I've had to learn this year too, because when I first started, you know, last year or towards the end of the season, it was all top water. Top water is it. So you know, coming in the beginning of the season, I really had to learn how to do subsurface stuff, and that's where I really struggled. And that's where I really learned how to, you know subsurface to, to go fish it. That was the thing. Um, but again, I, I had to go out and miss or, or skunk out a lot and, and, and to figure that out though. 
Uh, yeah, because yeah. you got you gotta like it's like with forward facing sonar with BFS whatever you gotta get out there and just fish it and yeah again this is not an issue but I know got I know people that all they do is fish tournaments all the time twenty four seven yeah they're good at it and they're f fantastic like there's no issue there but for me personally what I would have a problem with if it was me is I feel like I would get into the monotonous of doing the same thing and not experimenting because I'm in a tournament. In years past, when I didn't fish very many tournaments, I I played around with major stuff. Like, oh, let's try this, let's try that. Yeah. We're just out here having a good time, and I learned a lot more. Yeah, yeah. And and now that I'm fishing more kayak and boat tournaments, I feel like I start to fall back on like the damn swim jig, which I throw way too much, and it's unhealthy, and, and just things like that because it's like it's a tournament. You can't go experiment. That's crazy. And yeah, I agree with you. That's interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Um. And then you know, raise your hand and ask for help sometimes. Yeah. You know? Talk to other guys. A lot of the guys in our scenes, they're really cool. They're they're really they're really cool guys. And if you talk to them and, and ask them for a few tips, they're more than welcome to help you. Um, you know, they won't give you their secret spots, <laughs> but you know, they'll definitely, you know, point you and you know, point you in the way, you know. So definitely ask a couple guys who are, you know, or uh, much more advanced than you. They'll definitely help you out for sure. You, you got to ask the right questions. That's the biggest That's thing. Ask the right too. questions. Yeah, so got to ask the right questions instead of just asking for that spot or just that lure. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Because if you learn how to ask the right questions, you can help yourself out. Like, what areas do you look for? Things like that. Understand the creature you're dealing with. Because if you do that, the stuff will start popping out at you, and you could find it. And yes. most people don't do that, and it's. And I don't know if it's malice or just they haven't been taught that. Like, if you want my secret spot, that's great. But do you know why it's secret? You know, it's not just because it's not, it's never just because nobody knows about it. There's a reason the fish are there and it's not just pressure. It's maybe it's the stump, maybe it's the SAV. There, yep. There's a reason yep. you need to figure that out so you can find and duplicate that. Yes, yes. And again, they're not going to just give it to you. Um, and and then that just goes back to time on the water. Um, but again, with social media, Facebook, Instagram, there's a, there's a lot of good, um, a lot of good spot burning stuff out there that you get. I'm not going to say it's completely visible, but you, if you could research and, and kind of like hit that rewind a couple of times, mm -hmm. you could figure it out. You could figure some stuff out. Um, and that's kind of how I learned a little bit too, but, um, and, yeah. and Google, and, and I've said this a bunch on Patreon only streams, get yourself Google earth pro download yes. it to your PC or Mac. Yes. It, it's, you can go back in time, like 20 years. That yes. is how you find juice. Um, yep. just the basic or fundamentals, the, the yep. fundamentals of where they would start. And then yep. you could kind of, once you find out where they start or where they're kind of conjugating, you could kind of take that to the next you know, body of water, that next state, you know, you, you know, Tim planted from there and, and it's kind of vast. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's there to be had for sure. It's definitely there to be had. Jimbo, what do you got coming up? You got any big tournaments? You got anything that would be fun that we could promote or let everyone know about? Um, definitely my Instagram page, uh, Jimbo slice be fishing. Um, I'm, Trying to get that um, up and running. Uh, you know, Jared Mons kind of inspired me to have that uh, have that started. So that's been a few months in. So if you guys could help me to get the 500 subs, that's the first step. Uh, and I'll start, you know, keep on posting a bunch of uh, snakehead and bass and other species content. Um, and like I said, next year, I definitely plan on coming back to VK tournaments hard, hard. For sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah. I'll put a link. Uh, and I think Eyes Alley's guys, this will be re uploaded tomorrow morning to Apple, Spotify, iHeart, and YouTube. I'll put a link to his YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram there so you can click and go help support him. Uh, let's see. We got one. I'm going to get one more question done here. As Ricardo says, uh, Google Earth, search every pond and lake around your area, go try them. Like, dude, yeah. I mean, that's what, because it's, it's, it's so you can get the education. Like, I can tell you, like, the Res, the Potomac River, 
like brittle, those places have the highest concentration. Some of these ponds that we're talking about, they, I don't think they have a huge concentration of them, so they are pressured. They're there and they're big, but it's hard. Lake Brittle's got a huge concentration. The res does, and Burke. So that gives you the you, yeah, that gives you the probability of running into one. And the Potomac, for God's sakes, like there's a sh there's a ton there. You just got to go get out there and do that. Um, go bass fishing, and the CNO Canal. So parts of the CNO Canal have them as well. And that's yep. get a bike and just and just you got to pedal. But really, from Algonquian down that area, those pools on the canal, there are some snakehead there, but they're very temperamental to the weather so. yeah, four, four mile run is also another good spot yep um they're all all, all up in there um uh, and that just is a vast body of canals in itself yeah yep uh <clears throat> go up to baltimore um any of those like places underneath the highways that just never dry up there are snakes in there they're hard to get to and you might have to go bounce across a meth head but you'll find snakes there that haven't been touched like there's all those little areas in urbania that you can go to but again that's why i said like you get on google Earth to see which ones you can get to if you want to find your own like yeah. secret little, little little honey hole there but uh yeah i mean dude I, I really this was a lot of fun i always enjoy learning about these about the snakehead culture and how much this is blowing up in our area we talked to steve about that a couple like a week ago and this is going to become big. Oh, we got, oh, 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 this is a good one. Any snakeheads over 20 pounds yet in Vieira, Maryland, where do you think the record will be broken, Maryland or Virginia? You know, I think Virginia is going to do it. Yep. Um, you know, Maryland produces a whole lot of snakeheads. I mean, you could go out there and catch four or five snakeheads in a day, but, you know, Virginia, the quality, the, the quantity is a lot less, but the quality then... And some of the waters are just not tapped over here um, or known about just yet. So I think, you know, Virginia is going to be it. And it's funny, when you look at the Facebook pages for Virginia and Maryland, man, it's such a night and day how Virginia and Maryland treat the snakehead, mm -hmm. you know, thing. Like you said, in Maryland, man, it's kill on sight. As many snakes as you can kill on sight. In Virginia, man, they're like, hey, I caught a snakehead. This, this, and that. And it's just like kind of like a fun experience. It's kind of crazy how the two different states are, are very, very divided like that. And it's a uh, fascinating... And not, to, not to even mention the bow, the bow fishing side of it, too. Yeah. Um, we, I mean, we kind of talked a little about that, how there's a big, you know, rift between the states and stuff like that, too. But, uh, and that's a fascinating case study to me when it comes to society where you're promoting a species and you're getting more people to be hooked on the species because you're trying to get them out there. But what you end up doing is you also create the culture of catching snakehead. And that's a, Correct. that's a byproduct of promoting them. Correct. And because of that, for every two, if you have five people for every two that say like, I'm going to actually catch and kill all the snakehead, you might be creating three passionate snakehead anglers that want to conserve them. And so what will happen in 10 years, 20 years? Because I've, I've, I'm trying to get a bow fishing organization. I'll come on and talk about it. But I had a guy, a bow guy offline say, we don't want to kill all of them because if we kill all the snakehead, no one's going to come out and bow exactly. fish snakehead. So exactly. even, even they're like, we want to conserve them. So with my Instagram, with my Instagram account, like if you notice, a lot of them are just the catch and release uh, in or you know, reels. Um, I've actually been getting a lot of views on those. That's kind of, kind of funny. Um, but I get a lot of comments, a lot of negative comments. Why are you releasing that? That's an invasive, this, this, and that. And it, technically, it's our job to educate these people. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, you really got to educate them as, as best as possible. You know, yes, it's invasive, but no, you don't have to kill them. You could release them back into the public waters you caught them, you know. You know, you just have to educate people. And I think a lot of the, you know, VA side does that. You know, I think there's a lot of education in the VA side. I'm not saying Maryland isn't. But I think I'm not sure what it is with the Virginia side, but I think we just kind of hold it to our hearts a little bit compared, you know, to Maryland. Um, not knocking in for Maryland or anything like that. Uh, not all invasives are created equal. Correct. Um, and again, it's this is a whole other conversation we could go down, which is fascinating about when it becomes a cultural. It's in the cultural zeitgeist. Like the, the snakehead is more in the cultural zeitgeist than the blue cat is. A hundred percent. I would bet house money on that. The it got more people into angling. 
especially yeah. you had this perfect world of the snakehead, the COVID and kayaking all blowing up at the same time. Yep. I just personally, and it could be that I'm not at the pulse of the blue cats, but it didn't have that same pop. It really didn't. No, I, you're right. It didn't. And I'm just, I'm not sure what it is. Uh, Cause you know, catfish get huge. They get massive, man. And that bite, what I've seen is pretty massive too, but I don't, not sure what it is. I, you know, I think it doesn't snake it. It's so hard, you know, it's so, it's such a rarity in itself um, compared to the cat the cat the catfish stuff but top water biting yeah um the subsurface they, stuff subsurface they look cool they're aesthetically pleasing sight you know um sight fishing for them is is fun when you can kind of sight fish for them um yeah man and then again once you get them in the kayak or the boat you know you know just dealing with them is an experience in itself with all the teeth and everything like that so it, it's it's just one of a kind one of a kind yeah, it really is dude i really appreciate you coming on tonight as always guys link in the episode description to everything that we talked about uh, this coming saturday i think it is i should have this memorized because i'm putting the thing on but it's uh yeah uh, august 17th at 6 p.m at jake's bank tackle if you are a patreon member come on in we're having a patreon members meet and greet this is a beta test this is the light version we are going to be having a massive big patreon meetup uh hopefully late august november I'm getting uh, Captain Steve Chaconis, Jeff Green, Travis Eden. We're doing all the rivers, including the tidal Potomac River. Uh, that'll be coming late uh, fall. But right now, this is just a little say thank you. I'm going to provide food. Everything's free of charge. Come on by. Say hi. Just chill. Talk fishing. Like, subscribe to the channel. And we will see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. Hey. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.